Welcome everyone to our governance call number 13. My name is Orhan. I am one of the governance facilitators. And today we have a packed agenda. So let's jump straight into it. We're going to start with a governance update. And then we are going to talk about building an RWA opportunity hub. And that will be Colin who will talk a little bit about that. And then we have a big proposal from the ongoing protocol fees. This was uh, something that was actually started earlier last year, back in March, along with the, um, another proposal. So we separated it and started a separate proposal for the protocol fees, but you'll hear about that in a couple of minutes. And then we have an uh, update from database finance right after that. And towards the end, we have a special discussion with our very own Asad and Kate, and that's about RWAs and the credit-based financing economy. Is this refi? So a lot of exciting stuff on the agenda. So let me start with the governance update. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Since our last call, we've had two big proposals passed on Centrifuge, and uh, they were both for minting rewards for Tin Lake and the real world asset market on Aave respectively. They both passed and the tokens were minted and distributed to the, um, the reward wallets. And for Centrifuge, I believe the tokens were, were minted for, so we have for, I think two, two and a half months more, 60, 65 days. And for RWA market rewards, we minted for six months instead of three months as we've done the previous two times. So, and uh, another governance update is about the collator onboarding. We just wanted to give you an info about that. We are waiting for the block rewards to, um, to be implemented because it will make it a lot easier because if we onboard the collators right now, we will have to create additional treasury proposals. They are done manually right now. So we're waiting for that to be done and then the collators will be onboarded. And another thing is that the whole governance documentation is currently being rewritten and we expect it to be done by the end of the month. So all our governance process, the proposal types and like how to vote in referenda, et cetera, will be documented and be uploaded to the website. So that's expected to be done by the end of the month. So that's the brief governance update. And um, the first point on the agenda will be from Colin. So if you are here with us, tell us a little bit about what this RWA opportunity is. Hi. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about how I think currently outstanding on the forum, there's a, um, a request for comments on the pop version two that I put out on the forum. Um, and that'll be up for comments for in a, like another week or so, I think. Um, but I, I, I've had a lot of thinking about and a lot of dialogue with members of the community around this concept that the POP itself um, is a bit of a formal process and it's a bit of a formal proposal process. And so one of the ideas that I've been toying around with, both with um, current issuers, community members and others is this idea of using the forum as a place to create opportunities and introductions from people from traditional finance, whether those be organizations, uh, issuers, asset managers that wanna finance assets through Centrifuge, which I think make up the bulk of interest in real world assets through Centrifuge today, but also um, the concept of um, potential lenders or investors um, who are holding uh, either senior or junior capital and wanna invest or allocate capital to potential real world asset opportunities coming through Centrifuge. And then finally, and I think this is probably the least applicable, um, but folks that can provide services um, to the real asset space, whether that be on the, the lending side uh, or the financing side. Um, so what I wanted to do was kind of just talk for a second about this new section that I just put into the chat. Sorry for the noise in the background. Um, but 
what I believe here is that there's an opportunity for us or to use the forum as a place for introductions and opportunities. So with the help of some of the ambassadors, um, the link I shared kind of points you to what I would say is like a real world asset category, right? Where we're trying to include everything around real world asset discussion, industry insights, pops, um, some of the work that's coming out around the credit group all in one place, and then creating a safe place through an intros and opportunities subtopic for people to introduce themselves um, and gather feedback from the community. Um, we've actually already seen a couple of groups do this through intros and opportunities, which I think is really helpful. But um, what I think we, the reason I'm bringing it up here on the community call is I think we actually have a maybe a responsibility or we can work together on, on this as a community to try and get, to try and bring people into these conversations, whether that be community members who have expertise in specific industries or asset classes, geographies, um, or through your networks, um, trying to bring attention to these opportunities and bring discussion around these opportunities and introductions. Um, and I think from what I've found in a lot of my work is that there's a little bit of a, um, a need for people who haven't really gone through DeFi, haven't gone through forums before, aren't used to discords um, or you know public message boards to feel welcome, to feel safe, to feel like they're supported even if an opportunity isn't a fit at a certain moment in time. Um, and so we're testing this idea on the forum and creating this safe place and safe space uh, for people to engage. And so I wanted to make sure the community was aware of this, take feedback, thoughts, considerations here. Um, and then, then to the degree that this aligns with our mission of kind of being the hub for real world assets, um, make sure that we're talking about it uh, more publicly. So I'll mute out because I know my audio is not good, sorry. Thank you, Colin. Any uh, any comments on this new initiative? Any thoughts on it? Yeah, I think it's great. And I'm really curious to see what happens with this idea that there needs to be like this, a bit more of a safe space for prospective issuers to use before they just jump right in with the pool onboarding proposal because we've we've seen and we've learned that that's not always the best use of people's time there, there needs to be this warming up phase like a place to make asks and get feedback so I think this is great and for all of you listening that do have you know prospective issuers in mind um send them here to to get feedback to to put their feelers out basically and I think that's it's uh, let's see what happens. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, and one of the other things uh, that uh, we received feedback on is uh, from potential issuers who are having um, trouble like submitting the pop. They, uh, they don't know how to submit it and or what information to add. There's a Q&A section added now where these issuers can go and post their questions and it would also be a sort of an archive for when future issues come and see, okay, is, is my question answered previously? So we are really very much looking forward to see how this plays out. So great work and thank you very much, Colin. Any other, um, any other thoughts or questions about this? All right. Then let's move on to the next point on the agenda, and that is the protocol fees. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, an old proposal, not old, but this was already discussed like around a year ago. So now it is formal and has been submitted on the forum. So Ivan, would you like to talk us through what this is about? Yes, thank you, definitely. So for those who are not familiar with our through previous discussion on the forum, our proposal would like to implement protocol fee on centrifuge chain or uh, centrifuge pools. So what does this proposal mean? This proposal, if passed, will add protocol fee on centrifuge chain and in order to ensure self-sustainability of the protocol. 
we believe that this proposal aligned with the centrifuge down mission because fee paid in a stable currency, USDC, USDT, or EURC, will guarantee the future development and innovation of the protocol, as well as support other activity that are deemed to be in the best interest of protocols and token holders. So small specification about the fee is the fee will be defined as a percent of outstanding loans in the pool and will be set on for each pool during the deployment. The fee will be accurate every second on each loan and should be paid by SUR on any borrowing or repayment transaction in the chain. And the proposed initial fee is 0.4% per year. We have different parameters that could be changed or modified such as calculation of fee, the amount of fee, repayment action, or fee currency. So this proposal has been submitted the, this morning today, so still not decided yet that we can modify it in base of feedback or any comment that we will receive. Yeah, that's all. Thank you, Ivan. So it's important to highlight that this is for when pools launch on centrifuge chain and it's not for Tin Lake. So just to clarify that part. And uh, so, yeah, this is the request for comments. So nothing is final yet. And we would like to hear some input from some of you who have like experience with these things. So how we can improve this proposal, because that's one of the purposes of a request for comment to get input and make the proposal better. So any of you issuers or any of you who have experience with this, um, what do you think about this, this proposal and your general input on it? Yep. Hey everyone, um, Kevin here uh, representing Block Tower. Um, uh, just providing a couple thoughts uh, and, and facilitating some discussions. Uh, I haven't looked through the uh, new proposal in depth just yet. Um, however, we are you know, very much active and, and engaged with the century community and aware of the importance of turning on um, fees for the century chain. From our perspective, you know, a lot of, a lot of like at, at a high level, the proposal currently aligns with you know, our expectations of how fees would be handled on the centrifuge chain. Uh, for example, um, you know, using uh, the denomination of currency within the pool itself uh, as uh, the denomination for the fees. Um, that's highly aligned with how, from an issuer's perspective, how we can project expenses and costs associated with um, executing securitization on centrifuge chain. Um, other considerations that we've discussed um, sort of internally, but with also uh, other community members in the past, is how can we balance sort of the marketplace that we see um, that we need to enable on centrifuge chain, right? There are many ecosystem actors, uh, both issuers and investors, that are all driven towards the platform on, due to various incentives. Um, we would like to you know, continue, as we are doing in this governance call, maintain like a close conversation uh, with uh, many and all of these ecosystem actors. And until we have that data, and maybe it's a little bit of a custom, like customer discovery process, until we have that data, it's difficult to make an accurate assessment on where fees can be extracted. Um, other protocols and DeFi you know, platforms in the past have launched pilots to sort of suss out this kind of incentive, inherent incentive mechanism. Um, so I'm not sure if the community is open or has considered um, sort of a flexible arrangement in that manner. Um, but again, just throwing out some thoughts and discussion points for the community to consider. Would appreciate um, you know, broader thoughts on that. Thank you, Kevin, for your input. Anyone else? Want to jump in here? Um, maybe I can, I can, like ask a few questions and see where, like, like ultimately, and see where, like, we we can discuss as a community and how we can like start with with these fees and how we can develop it. Um, we, 
we need to well like it's as a protocol we're we're trying to build like a a, a way to, to to tokenize and, and bring real world assets on chain right um we, we can't we have to charge fees as a as a way to like build a sustainable product like it can't just be free fully free um there would be no way to actually no resources to actually develop it so obviously there is a need for fees but um the, the higher we set the fees at the more um the the harder it is to justify actually using centrifuge as an issuer especially in the beginning um when you're when you kind of like are are really an early adopter so from that perspective i think it's very important that we don't actually overcharge on the fees because otherwise we kind of kill the the like the initial utility that that centrifuge has today for for a, a very important part of our users um but and so that's that's like how i've been thinking a bit about where we set fees i would say like it, it's a good idea to start with fees early because if you make something free it's very hard to like start people to get to pay for it right um that's just just experience but then like where exactly those fees should be in the long run like I, I think kevin you made a good point like it's it's not entirely clear uh where um what the right place is so i i would i would say like let's experiment and report on how this is going and like have an open dialogue around in the long run and and it'd also be like super curious to hear from from the likes like Bok tower and, and other issuers like what um how this actually impacts your business model, how you're thinking about fees and TradFi, um, with also like what, what the product needs to do for you to actually like become more useful. Um, and, and as a way, of course, that we that like the the DAO can also build um towards yeah. making making it more useful so that obviously the fees also become more um be, become a, a more valuable um thing for us or, yeah. or the product, yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to read the proposal, but that 0.4% per year, is that against the uh, the amounts that the pool manager takes out, or is it based off of the underlying NFT loans? Uh, like, what does that specifically look like? No. Uh, Yvonne, are you are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. Zero point four percent. This is for loan. So, so it's multiplied against the uh, like the capital that's in each pool. So, if it lays there dormant and the pool manager doesn't touch it, is the fee still assessed, or is the fee assessed when the pool manager takes it out? Or is it assessed when collateral is created, like specifically the NFT loans? Or I, I guess uh, I, I guess that's the first thing that I was curious about. But I'm sure if I read through the the proposal, it'll go into detail about, or it'll, it'll show me those details. But I think if I were to think through like what I've seen in TradFi, I think if Centrifuge is positioning itself as a software technology platform. Uh, albeit a decentralized software technology platform, but if it's a software technology platform, um, I think, uh, like, I, I guess the closest comparison could be uh, Intex, which char actually charges a very small nominal fee, and I think it's actually fixed, uh, and it's based off of their library of data, so it's not just the structuring, uh, the structuring tool, but also access to historical data across all different securitization deals. Uh, so, and that's still a fixed fee. And then I think for certain credit funds, they'll charge a percentage of AUM. Uh, but basically I think the closest comparable would be probably Intex, which I think, uh, like I said, charges a fixed fee. So I'm not sure if that uh, 0 0.4 is really applicable unless of course centrifuge is positioning itself as sort of a combination of both a um a software provider as well as an aggregator of capital in which case then the fee structure could look very different where you're charging on 
the uh, amount of capital that's made available, uh, kind of like almost like a two and 20, but without actually being a two and 20. But uh, there's also the, the the fact that Centrifuge also operates as a marketplace. So uh, I, I know that Centrifuge is, is decentralized and I'm sure like the corporation, like any sort of incorporations are probably not based in the US, but I know in the US it probably, uh, I, I would imagine that it'd be a very, uh, I'm not the one to, to know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on regulatory issues, but I would imagine that there's going to be some sensitivity around whether Centrifuge is acting as a broker dealer and whether Centrifuge will need a broker dealer license. Thanks for the input. And super curious to share as much as you're comfortable with, but what's, what's your background or are you, are you one of the, or, or, or what, because yeah, you definitely, it definitely sounds like you have a, have a bit of an insight in, in, in the credit market. Um, are you, are you, uh, yeah. is you using Center I'm Future at, or a community member? I'm at, uh, I'm at NMAPS. Um, oh, my okay. background, I, I've been in structured credit for a little bit over 10 years, both on the securitization side as well as the uh, private credit side. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, fundamentally, Center Future is a technology platform. I think it is a way into DeFi. Um, you write Intex. And so for those that are not familiar with it, Intex is a, basically a, a data visualization portfolio management software that um, a lot of credit funds use to um, look at and evaluate loan portfolios. Um, it's kind of the industry standard um, for a lot of, of the credit world. Um, I think the difference here though is that, yeah, index, the index is, is solely a, um, a, a uh, like data, data like visualization I, suite yeah. that's not tied to the actual transaction data um well, actually, also uh, I, I do think they have a fixed price but that price is actually quite high in the hundreds of thousands as far as i know yeah um, it's like 130k per person but they actually have three different products actually and only one of them is a is a visualization suite i think the main value is their database of past deals and yeah. the up-to-date like collateral performance on each of those deals their other two products is basically a, a structuring platform which doesn't require any access to any of the historical deals and i think the fixed fee for that is pretty similar like pretty much about 100k per user and then the uh and then the third product is actually an api that basically connects into the uh it, basically the visualization like app is called Intex Calc and the API is called Intex Wrapper. And basically the Intex Wrapper is an API version of Calc. Uh, but I think um, like, of, of course, if you guys are charged, are gonna, I'm not saying that Centrifuge should charge 120K, but I think the closest comparable is probably uh, Intex or Intex Dealmaker, which is that second product that I was talking about that basically does the uh, structuring aspect of uh, of securitizations, but I think they're able to charge that high so, because like you said, Lucas, it's the industry standard. And I think uh, within like the transfer industry, people would use DealMaker to basically create a certain file that's easily shareable across all, all users in the industry. Uh, but I think, um, yeah, so I'm not sure if uh, it's, if that, if that total all in structure, the fee structure is comparable, but I think, uh, at least uh, in terms of the fixed fee nature, I think it could be. An alternative would be the looking at what trustees do, because trustees like basically just uh, take all the take the structure of a securitization and they'll basically just say, well, this per the waterfall, like the legal waterfall, we have to allocate the cash inflows in this way. And I think they take actually uh a fixed fee or for private deals, I know they took, they took a fixed fee, uh, but on securitizations, I believe they took a percentage of the underlying collateral as a, as a fee. I think if, could I add something real quick? This is Kirill. Um, I, I've never used Intex, but actually my father is one of the founding uh, engineers on, on the Intex team. 
Um, so I, I, you know, I, I know it just at a high level. I, I don't talk to, to him too much about it, but um, I can if needed. Um, but um, I think I think the to me like what what um, Centrifuge has built and is building is is more like a marketplace than than a data. You know, like what Intex has you know value prop is is having like the the past deals being able to structure and and um, and and you know kind of putting it all together and then being able to share across the different uh, counterparties I, to me. I mean, and maybe that's like where things are going to go, uh, in the future, but, but I feel like centrifuge is more of a marketplace where, um, you know, where, where counterparties can transact and people come together to invest in deals. Um, and I think like to someone's point, um, I think Jeremy's as well, but, um, about the, the, the broker dealer regulatory, I, but I think that charging like a fee would, would potentially, um, you know, run afoul of that. But if there is like a, a protocol cost, right. For a transaction and whether that's a transaction to, you know, to do a, a deposit of capital from by the investor or by the issuer withdrawal. I mean, it could be all of those or, or one of those or a few of those that is more of a, a, a cost of using the software. I, I, I think that would, that I don't, think that would qualify as a as a broker dealer type of a fee um so yeah i mean i i, I just want to say that it feels like more of a marketplace to me at least than than sort of a um an index like product yeah Thank you. I, I Sorry, yeah. Their hands up Sorry. just to yeah Sorry, I think Jeremy, the challenge yeah. is uh with just quick real quick piggyback on what Carol said i think I definitely do agree. It's and, and I think that's a challenge with coming up with a fee structure or with centrifuge coming up with a fee structure because centrifuge is more than just the marketplace, more than just a, a structuring and admin tool. It's pretty much all of the above. So I, yeah, I, I think that's just the last thing I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Kevin has been uh, sitting with his hand up. So sorry, uh, I missed it to start with. Uh, Kevin, feel free to uh, jump in here. No, I I would just say I would I would I would echo um what uh, Jeremy and Kirill said. You know, th that are both valid perspectives, right? Where when we're still in this kind of product discovery phase, we're still building out the offerings and services of uh, what Centrifuge Chain will be. So it might be a blend of both. Um, and uh, specifically on like the marketplace uh, dynamics and aspect of it, like within the TradFi landscape, we see both you know on the issuer and like marketplace investing side fees are charged on both ends and, you know, following kind of like efficient market dynamics, like the fees will ultimately be passed on like to the, you know, borrower or lender. So it's sort of a mood point, not really of where fees are charged because they kind of flow up there either up or down the value chain. Um, and the, and then I wanted to also um, address uh, Lucas's earlier point on, you know, we, want to set a fee schedule that both encourages adoption and growth while you know value capture and we don't want to necessarily think about starting with the product that is free from the outset because that establishes sort of um, a uh, an expectation uh, that's hard to take away um, you know one potential like route to consider is essentially like a threshold, right? So like basically, you know, fees were considered from the outset. However, fees are sort of muted or, you know, ramp up uh, based on certain milestones or TVL thresholds that are met, um, you know, uh, that are achieved on, on the centrifuge chain. So, so if that's, that's kind of, that expectation is set at the, at the beginning, um, it might help alleviate it might help balance both worlds of growth versus uh, revenue and value retention. So I'll just stop there. I, I know there's a lot of other hands up. So I'm uh, going to pass it on to, uh, uh, I'm not sure who the next hand up is. So I'll pass it back. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Kevin. I believe it was uh, Will. So uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you guys. And I get, my name is Will. I'm with Urban Gate Capital. We run a, a debt fund. So we uh, raise money from investors and lend it to people who buy real estate in Tennessee. Um, so we've had to like think through how we structure fees in our fund and with investors and, and things like that. Um, a question I had prior to like giving my insight was I, I'd like to better understand when the fees are 
being proposed to be charged? Like if an investor puts money into a pool, are they charged a fee then, or is it charged based off the amount in the pool? And like, and then if, if a, if an issuer borrows from the pool or extracts money from the pool, are they charged the fee then, or what are they charged when they put the money back in? Um, I think, a fee on the um, borrowed amount that the borrowers pay. Um, so a 40 basis points a year on the outstanding loans. Um, okay. Does that make sense? That does make sense, yeah. So if I'm an investor, I put 100,000 in the pool, I'm not charged a fee, but then if the uh, like new silver borrowers a million, they're charged if they have 40 basis points charged, uh, or, or if they have a million borrowed, um, then they would be charged a 40 basis, is it like once a year? Is that how that's structured? Uh, yeah, like, like I think fees would start accruing, um, and this is a bit like, like subject to what actually is, is reasonable to implement on a technical level. So, and so that's where I've been trying to help a bit on the proposal, but the, the the way to probably do this is to say on um, repayment of the loan, the, the fees become due. And so they start accruing by the second, similar to like how interest starts accruing by the second, like when, when you start borrowing on a loan, you, the interest starts accruing and equally fees would start accruing, right? Using the same kind of like methods on the, on the technical side to like accrue fees and on loan repayment, you, you repay the principal, you pre, repay the interest and you repay the, the protocol fees or you, you pay the program okay. fees. If, if, yeah, if that's the case, that's actually what I was going to recommend. <laughs> so if, if that's the case, I would, I would second that of like, there's no fee charged to the investor when they put the money in. However, when, you know, us as an issuer pay our monthly distribution, then a, a fee is taken out of that monthly. Um, I, so I, I would second that. And I, I think, um, 40 basis points is fair. So <laughs> I guess I don't have too much of an insight, but I guess I, I would second what's being proposed then. Thank you very much. Well, Asad, I believe it's your turn. Yeah, I think I'll take my feedback to the forum and try to continue the conversation with Jeremy, Kevin, and other guys there, because my my, my only context would be, and I, I've never used Intex, but I looked up the software after like kind of learning about it, did a bunch of research on it. And it's a little bit different, but I think that conversation's kind of already happened. So we know a bunch about Intex now it relates. And I was going to bring up how like fees are structured on like Swift and the like clearing infrastructure, right? We're, we're not an infrastructure operator necessarily. We're like open source infrastructure. People operate their infrastructure using centrifuge software. So I think that's also a useful model. And like, you know, clearing and settlement exchanges that like the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, which has all their stuff open, of course, you know, they charge for like in settlement input, and then they charge for actual settlement, and they also charge for like cross border settlement as well. Um, add additional fees on top of that to recoup costs. Uh, I know, like Swift, for example, is an interesting one because there's a fee for the transfer going out, the transfer coming in, and then all sorts of infrastructure and services used in between. But they also make it flexible enough where you can actually specify who should be paying the fee from like a wire perspective, should be the recipient or, the, or us or, or yourself, right? Um, different inputs I think that might be more useful in the forum to, to chat it out so yeah I'll hopefully see some of those guys there I don't know if anyone else will respond Rob thank you Asad. Rob feel free yeah so um I think the example that you that you have on the uh on the forum is great it based on like a you know pool size of 10 million so uh, I'm Rob from Database Finance. We're an asset originator. Um, I, I would change the example just so it's annualized. You kind of have it on 120 days, um, and you know, essentially on a $10 million pool, that would be $13,000 uh, every 120 days. So you multiply that by three, you get to 40,000, um, and that's where you get the 0.4%. Um, you know, I think as an asset originator, we're you know we're looking to maintain like a basically a 4% spread kind of between like the cost of capital that we bring in and the uh, uh, and kind of the rate that the money's going out um, uh, within our uh, within our pool to our, our clients and our e-commerce sellers. 
So the way I'm thinking about that is, okay, that's basically 10%. Um, so it's a 10% platform fee. Um, and is that reasonable? Yeah, that seems pretty reasonable. Um, uh, we obviously have a lot of other fees and other, other costs in our cost structure um, that's coming out of that 4%. And that 4% we expect to see compressed over time as we move beyond 10 million. Um, so that is, that's my feedback. Thank you very much, Rob. I believe that was everyone on the list. Um, anyone else? Feel free to jump in, comment. If there's no one else that wants to comment on anything that's been said, I'd like to just sum up some meta commentary on how we're how we're governing this this point. So, anyone else want to actually put forward a point on the on the fees? Because we're going to close this soon. This and okay. So this is, I think this is really interesting. Um, and I just want to answer one of your points, Kevin, as well, that I do think our approach here is quite pilot based in that via this process, basically we are, can adjust the fees as we learn more about how it affects use of usage and incentive, et cetera. So like, that's the nature of how we're governing this. Um, so we may see, you know, we hopefully a version of this RFC passes by a vote and the next round, we take what we learn and we we use that in the in the next process. But yeah, I think it's important to point out like we are starting in some of our governance processes. This is one of the big first ones, and I think um, it's it's really positive to see how we're actually governing. Um, it's I see this as a good example of what I like a, a bipartisan policy making process. <laughs> sorry to use real political terms, but actually led by a facilitator whose agenda is only to make the best possible pr proposal for the protocol and the respective parties. And by doing this in like a really participatory way, i.e. a lot of discussion, um, getting key input early and actually using this to create the, the RFC or the request for comment, um, this is actually good governance in action. And it's the hard part of good governance. The, the discussion in the RFC um, has captured a lot of different views and bit by bit we're actually edging towards off-chain consensus and there was room for a disagreement and there was some and I think maybe we're going to see some more now which is it's relevant right through disagreement you actually create the consensus necessary and I think it was really interesting because we have people in this community on this DAO with an eye on the sustainability of the protocol and this balance of incentives and utility and really interesting for me this is championed often by the people who may end up paying this fee well, you know this is a great sign um people like krill and Stu from database finance and input from will on the forum like it's obvious that you're governing this decision with an eye to your existence as a as a um, a stakeholder here and it, it was really good to see the moment of consensus forming around the understanding that paying in a stable is potentially a better option than CFG um, and getting good input from investors as well, like Lake Ginch. I don't know if I'm saying that right. And so throughout this process and through including the three governance calls we've had on this, we've also learned a lot together as a DAO and we've transferred a lot of knowledge and so now we're seeing a new wave of relevant data points coming in in this call and really interesting existing use cases that are um, potentially transferable. So now we're at the point where we need to ask what else is valid to make this proposal proposal better still. Um, so the, the questions you've asked, Jeremy, Kevin, Will, please ensure that they are reflected in the RFC before it actually moves from RFC to the on-chain voting part. Um, so there's still room for dissensus and for nay votes, but by the time we get to the on-chain voting part, like we're doing, we're doing the po policy making. So great work, everyone. And thank you, Kate, uh, Kate for those uh, for that closing thoughts on the process. So um, we highly encourage everyone to yeah take the discussion to the RFC because we all had some valid input and questions, and it would be nice to gather it all in the same post before this proposal is taken forward. Thank you everyone for your input. All right, 
Let's move on to the next point on the agenda, which is an update from database finance. And would that be Europe as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, Stu is out uh, raising capital. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, obviously we're all uh, you know adjacent to uh, uh, the the greater global macro environment, and we're all uh, either amateur or professional uh, global macro analysts uh, as a result. Um, and that world has been changing. Um, so our fees are going to be going, our, our pool fees are going to be going up. Um, we announced uh, this week that our drop tokens will be going up to 8%. Um, uh, we made that announcement out to our existing pool holders. We've made the relevant announcements in, uh, in line with the uh, uh, centrifuge's recommended change management process. Um, and uh, we're also going to be opening up our tin to our existing drop holders. Um, we've been pretty conservative on opening up our tin, um, uh, but uh, we're going to be a little more aggressive with that on a go forward basis. Um, from our perspective, uh, you know, our pool, you know, our client base remains extremely strong. Um, our pool has supported $90 million of uh, Amazon e commerce sales in 2022. Um, we think that number is going to double. Um, we've got really strong demand from our existing customer base. Uh, and the ability to deploy up to about $20 million within our existing customer base within about a quarter um, is pretty reasonable for us. So, uh, uh, yeah, we're focused on, uh, you know, making our pool attractive uh, to, uh, uh, you know, the greater environment. Obviously, with T-bills at, you know, 4.6% and our pools at 5%, um, it's a pretty uh, uh, difficult ask to uh to get an investor uh, uh, to onboard a you know a much riskier asset, um, so uh, so yeah, we're uh, increasing the returns, and uh, you know we'll see how that goes, um, and uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Rob. And I believe you made a post on the forum as well with the this information, or Stuart uh, made the post. So I hope it's okay that. Uh, we let people go and ask their questions there. I would love to let this continue, but we are a little bit short on time. So I hope all inquiries can be directed in that post on the forum. And it is in the chat if anyone wants to go and read about what Rob just said. So thank you very much for the update, Rob. Okay, now let's move on to the final point on the agenda. And uh, that is our special discussion whether real world assets and the credit-based financing economy, is that refi? Asad, can you please tell us a little bit more about what this fancy title means? Yes, I will happily explain. See, I think any governance call deserves really good in-depth discussions about things like protocol fees, but that gets too boring for me after a while. And so we have to spice it up and have some abstract discussions about what the future of finance really looks like. Because it's not in the fees, people. It's not in the fees, it's in the people. Um, and so with that, I was proposing an idea to Kate. I was having, I've been having some interesting conversations lately in my world of EFI partnerships uh, with the ecosystem uh, about some pretty interesting opportunities. And I was trying to understand how that better fit into Centrifuge. And Kate was saying, why don't you bring this to the governance call? We can have a chat with about the community. So here we are. Um, here we are. Uh, I guess I'll, we don't have a lot of time. We just have 15 minutes. So we'll do maybe a bit of a chat and then close out and then we have a conversation about it ongoing. But uh, basically here's here's kind of what I'm seeing, sensing in the world, right? We've seen Flow Carbon recently come onto our platform and issue a pool. We've seen Filecoin talk about going green and then seeking kind of, uh, you know, that's a crypto native issuer, crypto native asset, uh, seeking financing to go towards the green energy futures. We've seen BlackRock, the, the world's largest capitalist in the world, are, are, are the rulers of our planet, talking about ESG and, and moving towards that future as well. And then I recently had a really interesting conversation with the guys from the Mutual Credit Services, right? Um, where am I going with this? If you think about what Centrifuge does, feel free to correct me if anybody has a different way of thinking about this, is we are infrastructure that operates at the intermediation level of the financial services value chain. So if you have the money level where money is created, issued, printed, lent, right? Credit-based economy, whatever it might be. That's kind of like the monetary level of the value chain. You have the intermediation level where traditionally banks would stand and we're now seeing be replaced by DeFi protocols. And then the step after that is what I think of as like management of uh, 
you know, risk for cash and ongoing issues related to investment and things like that. So we sit firmly between uh, money and management, which means that if you think about it, we could use whatever we want. You could trade yen, wampum, invisible cash, monopoly money on the centuries platform. Um, and there's this huge ongoing discussion in the world, which I believe is known as refi. That's all focused on how can you take money and use it in ways that are more productive and related to certain goals. Um, I think uh, I think I'll turn to Kate here to explain that. But the question I have is really, or the discussion I want to have with the community is about how do we like better? How do we think about integrating with these different platforms that are going on out there? And to make it very specific, if I think about the DeFi ecosystem. We have stable coins based on crypto native collateral like MakerDAO and Aave that are launching in the next year. I think we're going to see a lot of money centers coming from the refi uh, ecosystem. And I know we have Beth, new team member who's on here as well from that area. Uh, and, and I think that's a really interesting opportunity for us if we're thinking about new sources of capital from within DeFi. Probably a bit early to talk about that, but I think it's an exciting conversation. But before we go further, we have to understand what refi is. I asked Kate, a resident refi expert, soon to be replaced by Beth. Uh, to speak very very soon to be replaced by Beth and I think um yeah it's it is worth having these conversations because we governing is like talking about these things right it's like which direction are we moving in as a protocol as a DAO like looking out at the world and like assessing what's happening so I think the governance call is a good place to have these debates no matter which um how early they are um, and I'm interested, Asad, in your interpretation of refi as something that's much broader than how it's typically understood, um, which is, you know, an approach to, to creating positive changes for the world alongside fin financial returns with the help of the blockchain. And the most obvious case that we've seen so far is with carbon offsetting. Tokenizing carbon could solve market issues in the voluntary carbon market. Beth, maybe you'll want to say a bit more about your experience there and also to help rapidly scale carbon markets beyond their current limitations. And so, yeah, we're working with Flow Carbon as an example to finance carbon offsets on chain. Um, and they've launched their first pool with us, which was to fi actually finance conservation work in um, Paraguay. But yeah, there are, there are a lot of other opportunities here. And I think this definition of it just being around carbon markets is limiting. I think refi is much bigger than that and our the the role of our wa's in refi is actually one of huge potential and i'm really i'm curious beth to hear what you'd add to this conversation and also refi did a great job of making a movement like making a brand and i'd be really curious to hear like what you did to to do that as well as your your read on uh, refi and our, our wa's yeah, so that kind of came out of a conversation that Kate and I were having about like where it is um, like RWA stand as like a kind of brand story that people understand and like affiliate with and um, uh, it was super interesting to think back to this time last year where there was kind of these separate discussions happening in the DAO community, the public goods community, people who are interested in like, you know, circular economies and like regenerative um, financial structures and stuff. And like all of those conversations were kind of happening um, like siloed and also, um, you know, like more and more they weren't quite fitting into the traditional discourse or traditional <laughs> two years ago about uh, DAOs. And so it's super uh, interesting to see how there was um, this kind of emergent interest in a theme that would link all of those. And that's what I think made the refi movement pick up in such a strong way. So, you know, we were organizing events like um, these regenerate workshops at different crypto conferences and also, you know, refi DAO and some of these folks were doing really great work with kind of compiling um, resources, like making platforms for people to speak about this. And I think the most importantly, um, like, uh, having this congealing of perspectives about like what, you know, what does like refi mean and what does it mean to be part of the refi movement? And I think that there's a lot that can um, be, uh, you know, learned from that or like inspired from that in terms of this kind of movement building of like, you know, what, um, 
like what are all the different things that uh, like real world assets like mean to different corners of the industry and like what conversations are not being had um, publicly that like by bringing those together, it starts to like create a really clear image of what that means. You know, we went from having to explain what refi was at the beginning of like presentations to that being like a standard track in like some conferences now. And I think, um, yeah, that there's a huge potential for that in this area also. <laughs> I, I actually think that that's like, you captured kind of the sentiment really well and I'm glad I brought it up today because one of the things that I'm kind of teasing out here is like, I'm trying to better understand like the refi market, like what's happening over there. And I would love to have more people from like the refi ecosystem on our calls here. At Centrifuge, like the, we have this eternal quest we'll probably be on for the rest of the, the protocol's journeys for however long we're around, which is like to find liquidity and find people willing to and interested to invest in the large space that is real world assets, right? And it feels like there's a lot of synergy being built just in, in the refi place, ecosystem, the industry. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to tap into that. But it, there is certainly a question we have to ask ourselves, which is how do we like take advantage of that? You, know, you can't just build it and people come. You have to build relationships, build understanding, and kind of then position yourself so that people know that to use you, right? Uh, so I, I think like it's a question I have is where does that, uh, like, you know, what is that? Who are the people in there that are investing money in that? Like, what are they interested in? How can we bring more of that to the platform? And, you know, then what are the protocols that are there and available as well? I think that that's super interesting to me because it's not just about finding money and then finding assets on one side. It's about finding people who are building infrastructure to make the whole process more effective and more automated and really just more fluid, right? So, so that's like another interesting aspect of it. And then Kate, of course, had, you know, she created the, she crafts the uh, the agendas and the titles for all these calls. And she said, is this all refi? Because the origin of this conversation was about like, how do you like motivate like alternative sources of liquidity and like a you know, liquidity constrained world or a world that requires it and demands it. And that was where this idea of mutual credit came up, which is like, pretty far out there idea, but ideas like that feel very important to us and Centrifuge and like the blockchain and crypto ecosystem, because this is the, the place where those ideas are being tested and grown. So it's kind of where the discussion was. I'm curious if anyone else has any thoughts. Pretty abstract. Maybe it's not as exciting as protocol fees. Seem to get a lot more discussion. I think, I think it's really exciting. <laughs> is like what do we consider to be under the refi banner like or like to ask the question in a different way like how are the the pools that are being created with centrifuge actually you know helping does it like um make create positive changes for the world which is an expansion of what we understand as refi but like there are many arguments for many of our use cases to be doing just that, right? If you look at uh, New Silver, which is, you know, fix and flip mortgages, it's creating more opportunity for people to be, to actually be homeowners of otherwise like um, dilapidated properties in the States, right? Which is addressing a major challenge. Um, so I think that we need to be bringing forward some of these use cases and pulling out the, the positive stories that actually happen on the ground. And I'm curious if anyone else or if any of our other issuers here wanna to do the elevator pitch for their, their positive impact of what happens on the ground with the loans they're creating. Sam, I see your face. Do you wanna add something? Uh, um, I'm not a, a refi issuer, but wanted to kind of set the um, workflow straight in my mind. Are we imagining that much like how uh, loan originators uh, that turn to be asset issuers on centrifuge would effectively be the ones uh, setting up the pools so that when there's liquidity, they could use the capital for uh, you know lending to specific merchants or farms for upgrading their business processes for carbon offsets, and then in return would generate a yield for the participants in the pools. I'm just trying to understand how the existing infrastructure can be used for a refi asset issuer. Yeah, I think there's two sides of it that I'll, I'll answer, Sam, Like because I was thinking about this, and this is kind of where the 
conversation came up in my head as well, right? I'll use MakerDAO as an example who provides a lot of liquidity on our platform today. It's been a great partner for us and we've been a great partner to them. I think, you know, Maker conceptually is a DeFi stable coin that achieves liquidity from the Ethereum marketplace, right? Rap Bitcoin and Ethereum are like the major asset classes on Maker that allow DAI to be expanded. As the, the DAI expansion grows, they have a stronger need to use that liquidity that they have available in a more productive way. They use Centrifuge and other partners to gain access to exposure to specific assets, right? So that's like the liquidity side of it, how Maker integrates with us. And then on the asset side, we bring assets that meet Maker's needs, right? Generally speaking, that would meet a stable coin's needs. When I think about refi, I don't understand the marketplace as well, but I think thinking about like carbon offsets, you can construct carbon offsets. I mean, kind of the magic of finance is you can construct carbon offsets into a financial instrument that has like a variety of different characteristics that would meet prospective investors' needs. Could be short duration, could be longer duration, right? So you could imagine anywhere where there is a need for, they, there's a desire to create carbon offsets that could then be constructed through the magic of financial engineering to be issued on centrifuge. The key question though is then, who is interested in investing in these products? in carbon offsets, right? And I think that's where there's a lot of value actually to learn from the refi ecosystem. Cause I imagine based on what I said earlier in open this, like if BlackRock is talking about this, Flow Carbon came on board, it was oversubscribed, the pool was, you know, super, super popular. It just feels like a very untapped market, but we have to find a way to build those same integrations in the same way we did to Maker, where we understand their needs very clearly, we have a very strong technical integration and a business relationship so that we understand how to serve them and we can do all the work and the hard work to then actually give them the assets they want. I guess that's the way I think about it. All right. Oh, uh, Sam, do you want to come with your closing thoughts here? Yeah, um, sure. When an investor comes to the centrifuge marketplace, there could be the you know, dual currency return that um, you can't really promise what the future value of a carbon credit might be, but um, you know there's the interest rate plus yeah. uh, the carbon credits that will be generated as a function of the operations that the funds in the pool um, end up creating, and um, the issuer can have dual currency compensation as well as the lender, and mm. centrifuge protocol could take. A fee from both, provided the uh, uh, USDC to carbon credit exchange is also happening on chain. Um, we could see a, a way to reflect why the world benefits and the demand for the world benefiting from better um, workflows and business processes actually turns to a financial incentive for the lender. And then the demand for the carbon credits would effectively be reflected in the financial return as well. All right. You're going to have the last word, Sam. But uh, thank you for, for this uh, interesting topic, Asad and uh, Kate. And thank you for you who contributed. So, and uh, thank you for everyone who who participated in the discussion about the protocol fees and giving all your valuable input, um, please do go to the forum post and write down and continue there so we can gather all the input in one place so we can make this the best, the proposal, the best version of itself. So thank you very much, everyone. This is going to be my last words too. So uh, see you next month, same place, same time. <laughs>